If you have your Bible this morning, I'd like to ask you to turn to 1 Peter. We'll be starting in verse 13. While you're turning there, I want to talk to you this morning about fine china. Now, this is not fine china, but this is the best thing I would find in the church kitchen. So we'll go with that. Kate and I didn't buy china. When we didn't order china when we got married. We decided we didn't want to have the china cabinet, so we just ordered some really pretty red dishes was what our request was. But how many of you in the congregation, you have fine china or fine dishes you keep special? Raise your hands high. Be proud of your china. Come on now. There we go. All right, some of you. Who, y'all keep it in china cabinets? China cabinets? All right. My mama, has, she has a china cabinet over there in the kitchen. It's full of, uh, I'm going to talk about your mama. It's full of, of, of nice plates, but that's actually, see, my mama's smart. That's the decoy dishes. She's got two more sets of china up in the attic, so she's really set. That's the decoy china. But why, we, why do we keep it in our cabinets? Why don't we just keep it in the, in the cupboards or in the, the shelves with other plates? Why, why is the china so special? To protect them. Why else? It's pretty there on display. It's special, significant. You don't, you don't mix it in with the common dishes and the paper plates, heaven forbid. You don't put china with the paper plates. And the, and the solo cups, you keep it separate. You keep it to the side. You keep it locked away. How, when, those of you who said you have china, when do you actually pull it out of a special place? When do you pull them out and use them? Birthdays. What else? Valentine's. Christmas. Y'all, y'all use Easter. Y'all use yours relatively a lot compared to other people. How many of you use maybe only, how many of you one time a year, that's it? One time a year you pull out the china. Two times? Maybe once, maybe twice. How many of you don't ever use the china? Just leave it in there. Don't ever use it. No, you don't ever use it. You don't want to get it dirty. You don't want to chip it. You don't want to have to wash it. Just let it sit in that case. Now, the reason I bring and talk about china is, is, is we do keep it removed. It is, it is unique. Now, for some of you, uh, your, your china may be several generations in keeping. Perhaps it was your grandmother's, your great-grandmother's. You hang on to it for sentimental value. You never use it, but you keep it. And you one day hope to pass it on to your grandchildren who will never use it, but keep it. It's a lineage kind of thing. And we know that something is special when we take it and we put it in that cabinet. We wrap, some, we wrap something nice around it and store it away to keep it from ever getting dirty or ever seeing the light of day. We tuck it away. It is special. It is, it is distinct. This separateness, this reverence, if you will, we give for these plates has sentimental value. It has uh, monetary value. And we recognize it as being something different than the other dishes. It is set apart. This notion of set apart is one that is familiar to us as we keep these things. There's a biblical word that talks about something being set apart, something being unique, something being different from, sacred, or even holy. The actual basic, fundamental, borderline understanding of the word holy is separate or removed. When we talk about holy God, the word holy has a lot of secondary understanding. They're also biblical. But at its very base level, is about being different, being separate from. We talk about God and his relationship to creation. God is not a part of creation. He is separate from creation. One of the biggest misunderstandings whenever you have pagan worship, whenever you have idolatry worship in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in our culture, is when there begins to be confusion about the separate nature between God being a part of his creation versus separate from his creation. And we begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. When we talk about, when we talk about um, morality or, or um, ethics, you have human ethics and human understanding of rules, but then you have God who is, is not bound to our sense of morality. He is bound by who he is. His very nature is distinct. We learn from him. He does not learn from our understandings of morality. 
he in himself as completely unique, distinct, one. We glean our understanding from him. And so we worship God and we're told that in, in our morality, he is unique and stands apart. You know, the way that we love. The way that we love one another is, is in a different fashion the way that God loves. It is a holy love. God has a holy character. God has a holy nature that is not bound by us. And what is so, when you begin to think about the separateness and the holiness and all those other things come into play, his righteousness, his, his loving kindness, his generosity, his patience, his wisdom, all those things are come under the characteristic of him being holy. And so our understanding of the holiness of God has, has grown into all these other categories, but at its foundational level, it's about him being different than us. And what's amazing, and what so sounds so crazy, is the title of this sermon, which is basically a reference to the Scriptures. Several times in the Old Testament, one's included in your notes, God says essentially, be holy, because I, your God, am holy. Now wait, 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 wait. We just talked, I just spent five minutes or so talking about how God is so different and so unique and so removed and so different. And he is the God as, as, as a triune God is just one and that's all. And, and, and we can't, we don't relate in the same fact function. We don't think in the same way. Our, our love is not the same. Our, our, our morality is not the same. Our creation is not the same because God was not ever even created. And now you're saying that God says this one who is totally, completely separate says to us, be holy because I am holy? How could we ever begin to think about doing that? Is that not just setting us up for failure? How do we even contemplate as human beings being holy? Because our God is holy. But yet his command remains. Three times in the Old Testament. Echoed here by Peter in the New Testament. Let's look to Peter, a disciple of Jesus Christ. One who walked with him for three years. Began to share the gospel message to the Gentiles to share about this understanding. Let us read his words and accept them as our challenge today to remind ourselves how we too are called to holiness. 1 Peter, three, 1 Peter begins in chapter 1 by talking about our, our being born again and the living hope that we have and how it is we came to be believers. In verse 13 he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you as a revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We pray that you will open our minds to receive this message that we who do call you Father, we who are your children, come to you now asking that you remind us, that you call to us, that you challenge us to live holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me repeat what I just said and then go back to verse 13. Peter says that we are to be holy, and then he quotes and says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If holiness is in our mind, and we're asking ourselves a question, how do we begin to, to look at this daunting task of holiness in our lives? The first thing he points us to is, in verse 13, preparing your minds for action. Some of yours may say, to gird up the loins of your mind. To gird up the loins in, in Jesus' day was to take your long robes and and your undergarments, and, and sort of tie them, cinch them up around your waist so that you could move, your legs could move, and you could do actions. A, a, a more modern-day um, saying might be roll up your sleeves, you know, roll up your sleeves so that you can get the work done. This says that we should be rolling up the sleeves, if you will, 
of our mind. It says that we should be, be um, preparing our minds for action and being sober-minded. Isn't it amazing the first two things that Peter mentions when talking about being holy is dealing with our thoughts? He deals with, with, with actually being prepared mentally to go about this task. We live in a world that is all about emotion. And what Peter says is that you need to set your mind to the task. A lot of us, even as believers, our thinking is basically sloppy. Our, our, our understanding of God's word is, is, is too... Is too um, mingled, if you will, with the thinking of the world. We've forgotten to draw the distinction between biblical wisdom and godly wisdom, between the things of the world and the things of God. And our thinking sometimes goes more to pragmatism, more to what's going to make me happy, more to what's going to make me feel good, more to what's going to make me popular, more what's going to cause the least problems in my life, rather than how does God call us to live? And we don't live holy lives because our mind is not geared towards doing that. Our mind is on the day-to-day -day task of getting through life and getting things done so we can get home and get to bed so we can get up in the morning and do it all again. And holiness, even thinking about holiness, even thinking about righteousness, even thinking about trying to do the things of God is, 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 is beyond us. Peter says, set your mind to this. Set your mind to the action that God is calling you to do. Be sober-minded, meaning let there not be this confusion or this, this lack of concentration or this, this uh, um, muddling, if you will. And a lot of us, we've called to Jesus. We've said, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I know that I, I do not merit heaven and my sins have condemned me. But it is through your death on the cross, your payment for our sins, and, and I put my faith in that. I put my faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we, we talk about giving our lives to Him. But our minds are still set on the old settings. He says, he says, it's what you think. It's what you think about. It's what you allow to influence your thought life. It's the media. It's the TV. It's the computer. It's the jokes. It's, the, it's all of those things. And, 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 well, we don't like talking about that. We don't like talking about limiting what we see. We're, we're sophisticated, educated people, and, and we can watch things that probably ought to watch, and we can listen to things that we probably ought not listen to, and we can look at things up on the Internet that we probably ought not to be looking up, but, but because we're sophisticated and, and we have freedom in Jesus Christ, and, and it's okay. Well, no, you're allowing the muddled, sloppy thinking to be what dominates your life. This isn't, this isn't a call to Christians. This, this isn't God trying to set us up for failure. It's Him challenging us. And it is accomplishable. And the first thing we've got to do is set our minds toward that end. He continues on. And let me just read it all together. Therefore, preparing your mind for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says that the, we need to have our minds, um, our, roll them up our sleeves in our mind. We need to be sober-minded, and we need to set those thoughts, we need to set those intentions on the fact that we have grace. See, that's how we do it. it, it it's us setting our minds right and then falling on the grace of God. That we, uh, that we received at our salvation, that we live in now, and that is going to be fully presented to us when Christ returns. Grace isn't just something that we talk about when we got saved. It's not something we talk about when Jesus comes back. It is also for today. His grace is His unmerited favor towards us. So as we're setting our minds on Him, He is giving grace to us so that we can go throughout our days and walk in holiness, he says, as obedient children, verse 14, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you to, is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 
as it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. He says that we as obedient children tell us not to be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. There was a time where we did, our thinking was muddled, our, our, our intentions were wrong, our, our uh, understanding of who God is was, was an error. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that is still how you live. There is still a lack of clarity. You may think you have it all figured out, but we live in a fallen, broken world that prevents us. And Jesus Christ gives us that clarity. And again, as I said a moment ago, that some of us, even after accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, we allow the old thinking to be the way that dominates our life. And it's difficult not to. It's all we've ever known. The broken systems, the broken home lives, the, the, the world's values. It's what we've known. See, when Peter was writing this, he had been doing ministry. Maybe if we accept all the timelines that Jesus died when he was 33 years old, this was written, and, and let's say if Jesus was born, we, we split our calendars on his birth, and I know there's some, some slight variance. If we take it just at face value, he's been doing ministry maybe 30 years, 30 to 34 years of sharing the gospel message. Some of the people he's writing to, they've just become believers. Some of the people that First Peter's written to are new converts in faith, and they're facing persecution. And he's telling them to stay the course and to stay holy. Many of us, you've been a Christian longer than Peter was doing ministry. And what is, what is dangerous is if you've been a believer that long and you have never set your mind to the new thinking of Jesus Christ. You've never tried to reign in your thoughts. You've never tried to take responsibility for your, what, what information you're allowing in. And you've given no, no reliance upon God's grace in your life now. You know your eternity is secure because you gave your life to Jesus Christ when you're seven years old and you're just waiting until he comes back or you go home to meet him. But you're not allowing any of his grace or his teachings or his guidance to impact your daily life. And it feels shallow and it feels, it feels empty and it feels in vain. Because it is, because you've never allowed him to impact you. This grace that he has, this, this altering of our thoughts, and you are still conformed to how you were in your former ignorance. It says in verse 17, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from a futile way, from futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like the lamb without blemish or spot. That's a long, several long thoughts in there. Let me try and, and, and tease them apart. First, he says in verse 17, that if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. He's saying that, that when we get to heaven, it's not going to be because of who our parents are. It's not going to be because of who, how much money we had. It's not going to be because of our social status. It's not going to be because of our job. It's not going to be because of, of our generosity in, in trying to, if you will, in the sense of trying to create a name for ourselves. God doesn't care about those things. God is going to judge us and look at us each upon the ways that we have lived our life and what we have done with the name of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that grace to fall upon, if you don't have that salvation, what you are going to be judged on are your deeds. So we need to be calling out to our Father, asking for that grace that Peter just mentions, and then realizing that we have this not because of the perishable things. In the Old Testament, they had in the temple gold. They had golden lampstands and, and, and golden tables. And the priest would go in and offer sacrifices. But gold can be distorted. Candles can burn out. Bread rots the bread that was given, the, the show bread that was put in the temple. And the animals that even that were sacrificed are not, even though they were perfect by, by the standards of you could judge an animal, 
It's all perishable. It's all, it's all destroyable. But Jesus Christ, who sacrificed His blood for us, He is totally, completely perfect. And the power of His salvation is unquenchable. It is eternal. So if you are putting your hope on anything other than Jesus Christ, who saves you and who guides you, then your faith is in the wrong thing. And holiness is not going to be attainable because you're not relying upon Christ. You're relying upon the stuff. You're relying upon your smarts. You're relying upon your job to find validation in your life. You're relying upon your spouse. You're relying upon your children to bring meaning and significance. And it doesn't come from any of those things. It comes from Christ. I'm going to skip down. Well, I'll just continue reading verse 20. He says, He was therefore, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who though, through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. That's where we're going to end today. It says again that Christ, who his sacrifice was established before the foundations of the world, was made manifest in the last times for our sake. Through him, we are believers in God, who raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory so that we could have faith and hope in God. It's as if when we become believers, now this is going to be a sloppy illustration, but I hope you'll stick with me. We're the paper plates. We're the soda cup. We're the Tupperware. We're the common. We're the unvaluable. And Christ looks at us. And he forgives us. And he washes us. And he takes us. And he places us in his holiness in the china cabinet if you will he looks at us and he makes us holy to be used for his purposes we are different and our thinking needs to be different christ did not die Christ did not sacrifice his life so that his redeemed could live like garbage. So that we could still be captive to our sins and involved in the, in the filth and the muck and the shame and the degenerate activity of the world. We have been set apart for something different. See, the challenge of being holy is made possible through Jesus. What he asks us to do is set our minds towards it, set our hearts towards it, and live it. How do you know if you're living holy? Examine your thought in life. What do you think about during the day? How do you talk to other people? How do you treat other people? Does it look like everything else? Or does it look like what God's Word tells us? Later on in the passage, we are reminded, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. In some sense, if you're a believer, you are holy because you're forgiven. You are set apart. But, but we also, as children of our Heavenly Father, must live it too. So this is a challenge to us. 
is it a challenge for us to remember your salvation? Remember your grace. Or, let me say it differently. Remember God's grace given to you. And realize that those old ways you did things, and for some of you, for some of you, your salvation is new, and you're still struggling because there are those old temptations that flare up in your life. Some of us have been Christians a long time, and we're still dealing with some of those temptations and those lifestyles. So begin to set your heart on the things above. Continue to set your mind, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is holy, whatever is righteous, whatever is beautiful. Meditate on these things. And then live it out. Realize who you are children of the living God who he is holy and through his grace made you holy you're already there now you need to live it now you've got to think it now you've got to share it let's close together in prayer Heavenly Father I come to you now and I thank you I thank you that you've thought so much of us, that you cared so much, and that when you look at us, you see something of value and of worth. You picked us up from the miry clay. You saved us from, from hell. You have redeemed us. You are restoring us. We are, if we are believers we are with you in spirit as, and, and in, in your word. And we abide with you. If we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. We must live it. God, remind us that you have called us for your purposes. Free us from the captivity of the former thoughts. Free us from the shackles. And if there's anyone here today who you are still bound by those sins, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, but you are feeling the call on your life today, I encourage you, I, I implore you to respond, to be free from those sins, be free from the guilt, be free from, from those things that have bound you. Find that forgiveness and joy and purpose and meaning that is true and eternal. Come talk to me at, 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 as we sing. Talk to me after service. If you know our deacons, talk to one of them. If you, if you have a Sunday school teacher who you trust, talk to them. Because there is a day of judgment coming, and we don't know when it's going to be. Let us, let us get our minds right, let us get our hearts right, and let us live holy in all our ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.